the Hadoop Plasma team at Uber. Uh, and this talk is the summary of our journey over the past few years at Uber to build a large scale big data platform. If you need to get in touch with me, I'll be hanging around after this talk so we can chat afterwards. But if you need to reach me after that, you can send me an email or you can connect with me on LinkedIn. And, uh, the, the, the slides contains the links. Uh, so the, 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 the agenda for my presentation is actually a brief, a brief introduction in terms of Uber's like, data and how data is used across different services. I'll do a quick overview of what we had as our first generation of the data platform a few years ago. And then I spend most of the time talking about what we currently have, what problem we have to solve. Uh, and I'll wrap the presentation by talking about what we're currently working on and what's coming up next. Uh, so, Uber's mission is to build a platform that can uh, ignite the world uh, and set the world in motion. Uh, so to that end, data is at the core of the company and almost all the uh, services and products that we build are somehow built on top of this data. To give you a sense of like, how data is widely used across the company, uh, so at any points of time, we have uh, 500, 600 uh, simultaneous concurrent experiments running, trying to Fit different features or try out new features in production to see which one are uh, user friendly and are uh, used by users better than the other ones to, to roll out in, in scale. Uh, at the same time, we have like services using this data to generate new functionality to the rest of the company. For example, the service that uh, Uber Eats use to, to estimate is a machine learning model that estimates the time of delivery for each food for your food. Uh, that is basically hitting over 800,000 uh, queries per second to, to, to update uh, users about what they are, what, they are, uh, what, should, what uh, time of arrival they should expect. Um, we, uh, on top of that, we have several thousand dashboards across the company that different teams uh, use to, to see how the business is performing and to basically make uh, business critical decisions based on those. Uh, to, get, uh, to get a better sense of like where we start in and uh, why we end up having so much data. So let's look at the, the, our trips growth over the past few years. So Uber started in like 2010. It took us six years to reach our first 1 billion trip. But then we did the second 1 billion trip within six months. And we did the, second, the, 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 the next 1 billion trip within four months. And we are about right now doing around 1 billion trips every two months. And with this, you can see the scope of this curve is exponentially growing. So we should be re-architecturing our platforms in a way that we can deal with like uh, 1 billion, 2 billion trips per month, but like very soon. Uh, and this is not just because like uh, we are going to know no new cities and what we are using the Ubers, it's also because of the fact that we release new products and these products are more sophisticated products. It creates a better user value, user expectation, but behind the scene, they generate more data because they are more complicated. So if you look at this graph that shows what, we should, what main features we did over time, in early days, in 2010, we only had the ride sharing business. So it was one rider, one driver, and one trip happening at a time. Then we started launching Uber Food in 2014. That becomes a more complicated product because then you have two riders within, within one, with one driver and one, and one trip. And then in 2015, we, we launched Uber Eats. Uh, and again, it's more complicated than before because now you have three parties involved. You have the drivers, right, the person who ordered the food, and the restaurants involved. And if you think about it, it's actually each food delivery is actually two trips at the minimum because the driver needs to go to the restaurant to get the food and then deliver it to the end user. Same time, we, uh, we started our efforts towards building autonomous cars, uh, where ATG started in 2015. And these cars are having tons of sensors, so they generate huge, huge amount of data all the time. All the time. And we are still running it in like pilot test mode. So imagine if we start rolling this out at some point at large scale, how much data that's going to generate. In 2017, we, uh, we started the Uber Freight, which is the service that allows uh, different companies to ship packages and products between different cities. We also started the Uber Elevate, which is like our uh, our drones that is the platform that allows drones to take us, uh, the right, riders from one location to another. Uh, last year, we launched a bunch of uh, similar, uh, other products, including Uber bikes. You've probably seen the jump, red jump bikes uh, around the San, uh, San Francisco. Uh, we also started Uber Scooter and also our service to, to, to give uh, to rides to the patients who are going to visit the hospitals or a, a clinic or facilities. So these services, again, they are becoming more user-friendly, they provide a better user experience, but at the same time, they also generate more uh, data behind the scene, 
and uh, we, we're definitely going to have more products coming up next year. So just imagine that the scale that data is going to be based on that. Internally within the company, we mostly have three categories of users. As on one hand, we have this, these op the city operators. Uh, these are the underground crew in each city that operates that city. Uh, so think, you, the way you can think about it is see it as like a small startup within Uber that manages one city. These are the folks that looks at the, the numbers within their city and make business decisions how they can grow in that city. Uh, so we have several, uh, basically thousands of these folks like uh, using our data to make business decisions on a daily basis. Uh, the other category of our data users within the company includes data scientists. These are the folks that looks at the previous data. They try to find the trends. They try to uh, try out new ideas on historical data. Basically, they try to find ways to improve the experience for uh, based on the previous data going forward. And then we finally have different engineering teams, uh, teams across the company that they use these analytical data to generate a new service and generate new functionality to the rest of the company. A good example is like the, the service that uh, allows uh, any, any, any other service in the, in the company to get an estimation in terms of time of delivery of the food or the service that uh, uh, suggests, uh, predicts the estimation time of arrivals of your the rides, the fraud detection as a service. So we have so many different services across the company that they use these data uh, to generate new functionality for the rest of the company. And we have hundreds of, of these services, engineering teams across the company using our data. Uh, so in terms of numbers, uh, if you want to get a sense of like how large our basically our infrastructure is, so we have a tripod strategy, which means we have our own data centers. At the same time, we also use clouds. So these numbers are the order of magnitude you can expect in one of our data centers. So in like one of our data centers, we have several tens of thousands of hosts. And these are having like basically virtual machines running on them. So we are having several hundred thousands of vehicles running on them. Our data size in our analytical data lake right now is over 100 petabytes. We have several trillion messages uh, generated and stored in our Hadoop cluster per day. So this is like this stuff is running at extremely large scale on daily basis. Uh, in terms of how we build our uh, software stack, uh, so we, uh, we, we heavily rely on open source technology. Uh, again, the stuff that we use is like uh, at, at a scale that no single company can operate this stuff on their own. So we rely on the, 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 all the companies uh, that are dealing with the same issues to work together and solve the data problems. And uh, to this end, we use a lot of open source technology like Spark, Hadoop, HCFS, Hive, Presto stuff. But many of these technology doesn't work out of the box uh, at our scale. So, uh, and it's more than just reconfiguring this stuff to work. We have to look inside the codes, and many times we have to find workarounds to bypass the limitation, or many times we have to actually patch or improve some of the architecture part of them to scale it to, to the limit that we want to run there. And our strategy is that we try to contribute back to our, our, our improvements. For example, like we, we worked extensively in the past two years uh, in terms of scaling the HDFS main nodes. We contribute back our observer main nodes uh, codes, but we are also working on our base federation. And we are trying to contribute these back to the community uh, to, to basically help everyone benefit from HDFS. At the same time, uh, there are gaps in the industry that there's no viable solutions out there for us to just take and use or improve. And so we have to basically build some of this stuff from ground up within the company. And again, we try our best to open source them as fast as we can so that the rest of the community can help us take them to the next level. At the same time, everybody benefits from those as well. Uh, specifically, in this talk, I'm going to talk about two of these in house domain softwares. One is called Udi, and the other one is Memory. And we're going to see in this presentation why we had to build them and what problems we are trying to solve. And they're both open source present in the data track. Cool. Uh, so uh, uh, um, our team, which is the big data team, our mission is to have a reliable infrastructure that we can ingest, store, and serve all these analytical data to the rest of the company. It's a very straightforward mission statement, but to make it happen, we have to uh, go through a lot of troubles and build a lot of technologies to get there. So let's start by looking at uh, what our big data platform looked like uh, a few years ago. This is, I call it traditional, but it's actually from three years ago. Uh, so this is the architecture of what we had as our big data platform back around 2015. Uh, if you look at this, um, so if you start looking at it on the left-hand side, we have different sources of our data. 
Uh, so Kafka is used uh, a lot across the company as a way to pass messages between different services or as a way to buffer messages you know, for, for, for a period of time. Then we have our data sets, like our important data sets like trips and like user transactions. These are stored in sharded databases. Uh, and finally, we have we used service-oriented architecture across the company. So many of these services relies on some, you know, some database to store the data. So we have all these data, uh, sources of data on the left hand side. And if you think about it, uh, we have, there's another part to the left of these data stores. So if you, if you wanted to make a big picture of how the whole thing works, we have two different roles at Uber. Uh, we have the online role. These are the absolute minimum number of services that are required to work properly and work with each other to let the users take a ride of all the different that you can. So this is the, 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 the online role. And then anything afterwards, uh, so when they, when a write when an Uber trips finished, that transactions get stored in one of the, these data stores, for example, that are uh, sharded data store. Uh, and uh, from there on, all the services are relying on basically analytics. It's called analytical board, which relies on these sources of data to to, to again to study data or generate new functional new, new uh, analysis of it. So uh, these are the sources of our data. Uh, so we built an ingestion uh, service. Basically, we had a bunch of Spark shelves that go into different sources, ingesting all these data and bringing them into Hadoop. One uh, early best that we put in this area was uh, to make, make the schema mandatory. Uh, because again, we, we expected these data to grow exponentially over time. Uh, and it's very easy to have all the data in one Hadoop data lake, but it becomes a, a data swarm that you can't Everything is there, but it's not uh, easy and accessible for users to access the data. We wanted to prevent that, so we wanted to avoid any low quality of bad data to get into our data lake. So we started enforcing schema from the very early days, and that pays a lot in terms of improving the quality of our data for our users. Uh, so when the data gets ingested into Hadoop, we store them in columnar five formats of Parquet. Uh, and the reason for that is like our source of data these are wide tables. They are, we are talking about several thousands of columns for our data sets, and they are deeply nested, five or six levels of nesting. So when you bring them into Hadoop, if you store them in column of five formats, it optimizes for the users to access this data in terms of their query cost, because most of the users, they're not gonna run a query across all these different thousands of columns. They're mostly interested in one or two columns or a few fields of these columns. And storing the data in columnar five formats is perfect way of uh, in, in improving the query uh, query execute compute cost for the users. At the same time, when you store the data in columnar five formats, the way you are laying out the data on this is that the data of the same time are going to sit next to each other. So when the data gets compressed, you get much better compression ratio, and your storage cost goes down too. So that's the reason that we had to. Pick a column of five formats, and the reason we picked Parquet at the time is because of its uh, relatively good integration with Spark. Uh, so anyway, so the data gets ingested into Hadoop and stored as co uh, as column of five formats of Parquet. Any data modeling happens within Hadoop on top of this data. So we have an uh, like ETL modeling teams that they read these source raw data and they generate. Uh, this is like a, a, a classic like a star schema. They they read the source raw data and they generate different dimensional of that. Data for the rest of the company teams. Another assumption that we made at these early days uh, was to uh, ingest the data into Hadoop in a, the as is format without any, letting any transformation to happen. And the idea behind that was if we let users to transform data in somehow when the data is uh, bringing, brought in into Hadoop, uh, what, what, what's gonna happen if two different teams these two different transformations? Then we need to bring in two different uh, copies of the data into Hadoop. So one other, uh, one other assumption that we made in the early days is we bring the source of data into Hadoop only once in the exact same format as the upstream source, and any transformation we let it happen within the Hadoop on top of these data in the scale uh, So this was our Hadoop data lake. So everything, the raw data as well as the model data was landed in Hadoop. And then the users across the company, they could access these data directly through query engines like Hive and Hive or Presto. Uh, that they can, can write basically SQL statement, or the users who need programmatic access to this data, they could use Spark or Notebooks to access this data. At the same time, we load the subset of, of our data, mostly the very recent sets of data to our warehousing software that allows uh, most of the, these city operators to run their SQL statement in a very fast fashion. 
So with this architecture, we were able to store a few tens of petabytes of data in the data lake. At the same time, we were able to provide the data latency of 24 hours. Cool. So the big wins that we get out of this is this, is the, this was the first time that we had all the analytical data in one place. So it basically opened doors for the rest of the company to do whatever they want. So everybody was so excited. There were more and more users trying to build services on top of this data. And it basically was the first time that we were using, we were able to use the full potential of our previous data to build new products on top of them. So it was a very big thing for us to have all this data together in one place. But at the same time, this popularity led to more and more data uh, to be brought into Hadoop. So we soon started facing the, the limitations with like bringing too much data. The first pain point that we had at the time was scalability. And this scalability is, has two folds. One is that we use HDFS as a file system. So HDFS is scalable when you get to a few petabytes or a few tens of petabytes. When you get to 30, 40, 50 petabytes, you're gonna start seeing all the corner cases. And that was one of the limitations because our, we soon start looking at those, those corner cases and those limitations. The other limitation that we had with what this was with our ingestion platform. So it wasn't a real platform. So we had a bunch of custom ad hoc spot shelves that were connecting different data sources and sucking in the data into Hadoop. The problem with that is these are very fragile. It wasn't like it was custom. Someone wrote a, a, a spot shelf to bring the data in. So it worked one, fine when we had a few tens of tables, a few hundreds of tables. But when we start having like a few thousands of tables, uh, these pipelines were very fragile and they were breaking every day. So we had multiple engineers just doing nothing but to going and trying to fix these pipelines and making them work. So the data reliability was significantly affected because of these fragility. The second limitation that we faced was in terms of data latency. So uh, we were uh, getting the data from the source in the snapshot model. Basically, we went to whatever data store we have upstream. We made the snapshot at that time convert everything to Parquet, bring it into Hadoop, swap the tables into Hadoop and let users use the new data. This was working fine, but again, our data set was growing in size. In size so our chips table was, for example, a few hundred terabytes. So when you go and bring it into Hadoop, it takes several hours to convert it into, into Parquet. So it wasn't scalable. So that's why the latency, data latency couldn't go lower than 24 hours. At the same time, our data by nature has a lot of updates. And dealing with these updates and data logging data was also a big problem. Our modeling was also happening all, uh, on top of these raw data that were uh, refreshed in a snapshot way. So the model table also has to work in a snapshot model. So they need to re regenerate the entire model tables every time. And this was, again, obviously not scalable and not efficient at all. So to better understand what I mean when I said our data by nature has a lot of updates, let's look at one specific data set, for example, our chip state. So the source of our data store is like basically some sharded data, data store at this, at, at, in our upstream. So the, the chips get stored here. We have like basically a stream of these change logs from these sources coming into Hadoop. And we have a batch job that runs, let's say, every, every few minutes or hours uh, and brings this data into Hadoop. When the data gets into Hadoop, the date to optimize the, the cost of query, we partition the data based on date. So based on the date that the trips happens, the data gets into one of these partitions. Uh, so for example, if you take a trip today, and uh, let's say you take a trip, the trip pay is $15, that gets basically ingested and stored into the partition. This is one of these, for example, green boxes that is the new date. At the same time, you later tomorrow look at the trips, your, your receipt and say, oh, $15 is too much. Uh, the driver probably not take the optimized route. So you basically support, uh, uh, you, you submit a support ticket uh, asking our team, uh, our customer uh, support teams to look into that. They look at that and say, oh yeah, there was a mistake of the driver uh, overcharged you for any reason, but they change it back to $5. Now you have an update on your previous fare. That is an update that you see. And this can happen like uh, for the trips that you take, usually within a few days. Uh, the other form of updates that you may have is that like, when you rate your driver. So you rate your driver uh, next time that you take a trip. And if you don't take a trip on a daily basis, which I hope is no one is so good in that category, then you're gonna maybe rate your driver next week, next month or sometime after that. So depending on the, the, so the, the origin of the updates, you may get an update for a few days ago, or a few months, months ago. And again, we may at any time, end of the year, uh, uh, 
all right? And our financial things, the finance thing, they try to give back to me for some tax purposes. So we're gonna have updates. So we initially were trying to find work account and that basically hide it under the rug, but it was a natural part of our data sets. So we had to find a solution to deal with that. Uh, so let me see how are we doing in terms of time? Huh? Okay, I'll go. I need to, you know, I, I wanted to see how much I, how much, anyway, so I'll go faster. Uh, so anyway, so the way, the reason that our data latency was remaining at 24 hours was because we have, we get a stream of all these change like for our upstream data store, but we couldn't bring them into Hadoop yeah, at, once, uh, in, uh, at once, because again, Hadoop is append only. Uh, at the same time, if you are storing the data in columnar file formats. So columnar file formats, you have to have your whole data sets in memory and then organize it and flush it into this, correct? Right? So if you get them here and we try to have large files in Hadoop, so let's say we have 128 megabytes, 256 megabytes of file. Now there's no way you can go and update one record in that file. That file contains several thousands of records, right? So the way we were able to absorb these updates at the time was we had some technology like HBase that allows updates. So we get a stream of change log from these sources, we put them all in HBase, and we make a snapshot out of HBase every few hours, and we reconvert that data into Parquet, and we swap the tables into Hadoop. And this snapshot generation conversion to Parquet takes time. Our input trips, it was several hundred terabytes. And it was at when, when we, we, we moved to our next technology, that job itself was taking 20 hours. So there was no way that we can refresh the data faster than 24 hours. And so and that's why the latency was still remaining at 24 hours. And so let's fast forward and look at the, how we solve the problem and what. Uh, we, we currently have to, to, to allow users to have access to faster data. And so the main motivation for rebuilding this platform was, again, Hadoop become extremely popular and a lot of teams were using their existing data. They demanded like basically more reliable data. At the same time, we were seeing that the data uh, is growing exponentially in size. So we have to think for long term. And this was the first time that we were out of those firefighting modes. So instead of like trying to gradually improve the service, we spend the, 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 some time looking at our data set, what data set we're dealing with, what are the, 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 the characteristics of our data set, and most specifically, how, what's the access pattern? How are users coding these data? And we try to build a, the new architecture that is long last and it's gonna last us a few years. So let's look at the, the, the limitation that we had and how we solve those problems. The first limitation that we had was HTML scalability. This is like a very common problem. So everybody who starts having more data, they're gonna hit it at some point. Around a few tens of petabytes, you're gonna see the name was becoming the buttons. Uh, it's a painful uh, thing to fix, uh, but it's, it's a lot of companies have dealt with that in the past and they, they uh, fortunately they have published their solution. So it's a straightforward way to scale that beyond that. It's, it's hard, but it's straightforward. Again, that's, in some way you have, to, uh, you have to basically scale your name nodes and many, many companies do that by basically uh, clustering their data set into the, across different uh, Hadoop clusters. Uh, and they use some form of basically, they use UFS or federated name with some way to, to redirect users between these clusters. Uh, and if you avoid files, uh, small files, and you have a few uh, Hadoop clusters, uh, then you're gonna be able to get to like beyond that few tens of petabytes. Uh, so I'll, I'll skip the details here, but we have a detailed engineering blog post on that. If you want to know more about that, I refer you to this engineering blog post. Uh, so the other problems that we had was the, uh, the scalability <laughs> issue with our ingestion flat platform. As I said, it wasn't a platform, it was just a bunch of ad hoc spark jobs bringing the data in. Uh, so what, the way we solved the, our ingestion uh, is, uh, like scalability issue was to build memory. Memory is uh, basically a data ingestion and dispersal framework. It's designed uh, in, a, in a generic way that it can connect to any source and it can connect to any things and it moves the data around between these two. It's very modular. It's built on top of Spark, so it's horizontally scalable and it allows users to easily uh, add a new source or a new things or pipe, basically create a pipeline of these sources and things. Uh, the good news for you is that it's already open source. Uh, and uh, if you want to know more about it or using it, uh, we, we have another engineering blog in terms of the details of that, so feel free to give it a try. Uh, at a very, very high level, uh, we have a, a, so this is how memory is uh, implemented. So it has a bunch of uh, source connectors and a bunch of sinks connectors, and between these two are a bunch of converters. 
and you can define any logic for your converters as soon as, as long as you have a connector to get the data in and get the data out. And you can have a multiple of things to transform massage data on your data. Uh, at this, so we, so we, we started moving all our jobs from a bunch of ad hoc Spark jobs to memory platform that makes it more organized. And basically, we didn't have to go and fix individual pipeline issues. We had to just build and make our platforms reliable and ask users to unload the data into that. At the same time, we standardized our data model in Hadoop 2. Uh, and uh, we introduced basically two sets of tables in, in our Hadoop. Uh, we use our raw data tables. Uh, so if you think about it, we have a, like a data store that, for example, we store all of this data at the, uh, at the very top level, it's transactional data store. And uh, so there's a bunch of, for example, row one, column one, value A, value B, value C, value B comes here. Uh, if you think about that, so for row one, you initially have value A, value B, and then it becomes updated to value C and value D. So when you bring this data into Hadoop, uh, we generate two tables out of that. One is called change log history tables, which means it gives you the history of changes per each row. Key. So you can know that row one initially had value one, value A at time C zero, then it, uh, column B it becomes value B. So you can see the history of these changes. At the same time, this is like a, a sparse table. And if someone wants to basically get the latest snapshot, they have to go and basically merge the whole thing, right? which is very inefficient. Uh, but it has its own use cases. So on top of that, we also provide the merge snapshot tables that uh, allows users to see the current latest values for every bit. So it basically combines, basically merges and compiles these tables uh, in, in a merge snapshot table. So we provide these two tables for all our upstream data sources, and this allows users to pick the ones uh, based on their use cases. Uh, okay, so let's focus on the other problems that we, that we have to solve. Uh, so the other problems that we had was, okay, the data latency was too high. We were having basically snapshot-based ingestion of data that only allowed the new data to get in every 24 hours. So we had to move out of that, and we, have to, we had to move to a model that allows incremental ingestion, which means we get the upstream changes and we only bring those into Hadoop and we update our previous data rather than regenerating the whole data set just because one they got upstream is updated. Uh, so that was one problem that we had to solve. The other problem was the, the need to address basically updates and deletes. Uh, and again, we need to be able to column our data, we couldn't get rid of that because that's optimized for storage and quality. We need to find a way to provide update and delete functionality on top of this column of data. And if we could do those stuff on the modeling side, the reader side, uh, they need to also be able to, uh, to incrementally update these fact and dimension tables without regenerating the whole tables. Uh, so that was basically the modeling table. Uh, model, the modeling part also had to move from snapshot-based modeling to incremental modeling. And the way we, tech, we solve this problem is by uh, building a storage abstraction library called Hoodie. And Hoodie stands for Hadoop Upsets and Deletes. It's a storage abstraction library implemented on top of Spark. So by nature, it's horizontally scalable. Uh, and it basically provides you with two main functionalities, two, two main primitives. One, it basically allows you to, to perform upsets which means uh, having a HDFS or having a file system with a bunch of columnar files in it, it allows you to go and update, delete, or insert records without the need to regenerate the database. So it gives you the absurd functionality. At the same time, on the reader side, uh, it, it lets the readers, the users, to incrementally pull out only the change data. Think about our chips table. We are having several billion records there. A few like new chips gets added at the end, some of the records in the past gets updated. So a users who are reading this table, for them to know what records are new or updated, the only way they could do it in the past was to do a full table scan and try to use some notion of time to find the records that are updated. Uh, which could, and that, again, a full table scan at that size is extremely uh, expensive and uh, not efficient. So Hoodie, what provides is a, a, a functionality called incremental pool which means given a timestamp, it gives you a stream of all the records that are observed, deleted, or inserted in that database. So it's extremely useful for the users who are actually using this data. Too. So the good thing about Hoodie is, again, it's open source, and it only relies on HDFS to operate, so it doesn't have any other dependency. We also have another uh, detailed engineering blogs on Hoodie, so if you want to learn about more about that, I'll refer you guys to, to that blog post. Uh, so this is a very high level overview of how Hoodie works. So we have a batch of like uh, 
change logs that's coming in. This includes updated records or new records to be inserted. Uh, so when you get this data into Hadoop, you obviously have to store the actual data somewhere. So this is the data files come containing the, the records. On top of that, Hudi creates an index. So next time you want, you need to find the records, you can use this index to see what files and what partition contains that. Uh, ad in addition to that, Hudi also stores some uh, metadata information in terms of what time and what records was inserted. And this is later used when the users needs to uh, pull out only the change data rather than the completed scale. Uh, so this is the high level how Hudi works. Uh, and uh, okay. I need to move a little faster. So uh, incremental processing is the key for the, uh, for the readers to be able to efficiently read the updated data in Hadoop. Uh, so think about it this way. You, it provides stream functionality on top of the batch data. Basically, you are running batch mode, but you can access the data. You can get a stream of change data, which makes it very efficient because you don't need to the scan. And, uh, so again, if you think about traditional, for example, Lambda architecture or how different companies align streaming and batch uh, uh, technologies. So if a user needs like uh, data as fresh as like a few seconds, they, the only solution they can go with is mostly like a database, a traditional database. If they need something between, for example, one second and one day, uh, a lot of companies, including us in the past, uh, we commit users to some streaming fashion. And anything, if someone or some application don't, don't care, doesn't care about like basically data being older, like not as fresh as 24 hours, then you can do the your, your query in a very optimized way, but it's gonna be a fact in, in the batch way, but it's gonna be dealing with the data that's like 24 hours later. With Hoodie incremental processing, we can we were able to move this threshold between stream and batch from one day down all the way to a few minutes. So now you, we have the same thing that users will need like the data within like a, within like basically a few seconds and uh, like five, 10 minutes, they still need to go with streaming, but all the other users who need data between a few minutes of freshness and a day, they now can rely on incremental batch and who need to give them the stream of these uh, object of records. And anything beyond that, obviously you can fall back to your, your traditional snapshot based batch. Uh, so, so uh, there's another examples to give you a sense of like how Hudi works. Uh, so think about it, like we have the same, uh, like a batch of two batches of data coming in. So the first batch contains key one, value A, value B, key two, key three, and some values. And the second batch that we ingest, it has an update on key one and a new record key four. So if you look at these tables, like this in, 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 in your data store. So initially you have key one, value A, B, and key zero. Later at some time, it becomes like value H and G, and this key for K4 was also added later. So Hudi provides two modes to read the same table in Hadoop. One is the latest mode, which is the snapshot model, which basically at any point, it gives you the latest snapshot of these values. So if you look at this table, you got for value one, you're gonna see value G and H, and you're gonna see K4 if, if you query the table at T4, at T2. At the same time, if you are having like an iterative like ETL jobs that keeps like running some modeling or some applications, some, some specific query on top of resource tables, and last time you run it was at time T1, next time you want to run it, you don't want to reprocess the whole data. So you can pass in your previous checkpoints, like your T1s, and Hoodie gives you only the updated or inserted records after that time. So it makes it very efficient for the users to get access to these updated and new data. And this is how our architecture looked like after we introduced primary and put into the platform. So we get a stream of change log from the upstream source and we ingest these into Hadoop using like primary as well as the Hoodie to update the previous data. And so this allowed us to uh, bring our data latency down from 24 hours to just uh, like 30 minutes. Uh, so that's for all the raw data. And then there was 30 minutes on top of that for the data modeling and all the other jobs using this stuff. So our end-to-end -end data latency was brought down to 30 minutes. At the same time, we, like, by scaling HDFS and building a relatively reliable platform, we were able to scale our data size down to different things as well. And this is like a, a, like a very, very high level overview of like all these components put together. So we have different sources of data across the company. Uh, our handover is across uh, between, uh, between the uh, data source and the, the Hadoop boards are in Kafka. So they give us a stream of the change, change data and the memory bring them all into Hadoop, store them in Hadoop file formats and users can uh, 
play around with this data during in Hadoop using high Presto or Spark. They can play all different platforms. So we have other platforms like Stefan is going to talk about machine learning platforms. This machine learning platform runs on top of this Hadoop data and it generates some new data. It can be models or it can be new sets of new data, derived data sets. And sometimes, for example, think about the Uber Eats. They bring all the data into Hadoop, they run a, like a, a daily uh, machine learning model uh, that generates a new model for becoming the new restaurants. And at some point, they need to take this new model out of Hadoop back to their online data store to serve live traffic. And Marmary allows them to get the data out of Hadoop and disperse it out of Hadoop as well. And we have a schema service on top of all this stuff to make sure the data is consistent across the, the, the whole uh, platforms. At the same time, it makes sure that the quality of the data is matching the, 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 the predefined schema by the, by, by the producers. Okay, cool. So this is what we currently have. So are we done? Uh, obviously not, because I'm still working there. Uh, so, uh, so let's look at uh, what, what problems are remaining and what we're currently working on to solve. Uh, so the first one is like uh, the data quality. So data quality is gonna be an ongoing battle. So it's never ending. We did a good job initially to make sure the data that we bring in are structurally safe and matching a predefined schema. Uh, but there's a problem is we, we, we enforce the schema within the analytical data world. We do have an online RPC host for all these services to use, and they have very flexible schemas uh, in that world. So there was a disconnect between the online boards and the analytical boards, and they were both having their own uh, data schema. So one effort that we are currently working on is to bridge this gap and have one schema defined across all these different boards. That's one effort that we're working on. The other uh, uh, initiatives that we're working on is to move beyond having structural type checking of data and starting to define semantic checks. For example, you can define like a value in your data as integer and it's an age. So if an age of a person, you can't have a negative number, you can't have a, a, a thousand value for that. So you have to be able to restrict that to a certain place, right? So we wanna move beyond structural type check and we wanna be able to define semantics on the working state. Uh, at the same time, uh, uh, the, the, plan, the, the current platforms, we have 30 minutes uh, data freshness for our raw data arriving into Hadoop. Again, it's extremely uh, improved compared to what we had a few years ago, but that is not what the business needs. Our business still is asking different things. We're still asking for much faster data than Hadoop. So we are working on technology that lets us bring the latency down to five to 10 minutes. And hopefully that's gonna happen uh, in, in 2019. Efficiency is our big, uh, next effort. Uh, again, uh, at some point we want to go public. So the hardware cost is a big portion of our, our basically our infrastructure. So we need to think about the efficiencies. Traditionally, we were using Mises for online services for scheduling on the services, and we were using Yarn in Hadoop for scheduling of batches. Uh, so what right now, one of the projects that we're working on is a project called Alison. Uh, that is a unified resource scheduler across Hadoop and online services. Uh, so it helps us basically improve our hardware utilization. At the same time, having one scheduler with us to get a better insight of what's going on, what type of hardware we need to add. Hoodies are still an active project. So we, we implement first, like Hoodie Storage 1.0 uh, that we are running currently in production. Uh, we've been working on version two of that. Uh, which uh, significantly improves the performance in terms of dealing with updates and deletes. Uh, to give you a little bit, just have a few minutes. So I'll quickly go over these slides to give you a taste of what Kudi 1.0 is doing and what uh, improvements we made last year. Uh, so the Kudi 1.0, which basically is work based on a technique called copy and write. So you get these batches of data over time and you have row one, row two, row three, and then you get updates on row one, and you get our place on row one, row two. So these these batches we receive them uh, like at time, let's say every one hour parts. When you bring these data into data, so the first batch you are get your ingestion service, it puts it into one part reference. So you have all these records here, and then you receive the second batch. Right, it has one records update. So the 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 final data is written in the part file format. So you can there's absolutely no way to go and modify the, the actual file contents. So what Hudi uh, does behind the scene is it creates a new version of that file. It copies the data over, updates that records, and versions those files so we know what versions we are in. And as you get more updates, it creates more version of these. At some point, we go and clean up the, the oldest versions, uh, but it, that's how Hudi works behind the scene. But uh, this, uh, I think it's clear for everyone that it, 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 it lets you have the notion of updates in your ingestion platform, 
But behind the scene, it basically results in high write amplification because you are rewriting a whole file because of one that was getting amplified. But this was like what we had at the time. So the, the way we solve this problem is called PD storage 2.0 or a technique called, we call merge on read. Uh, so in this solution, when you receive these batches of data, the first batch you, you receive, you write it into a parquet file. But any batch that you receive after that, you don't want to rewrite a whole like 128 megabyte, 256 megabyte file just because of one request being updated. The way we deal with that is we create a row file format, Apple file formats next to that base parquet files and we keep storing these updates next to the, the original files at when we have a, a synchronous compactor that based on some policy goes and merge these two files and creates a new file only when we have enough updates to justify the cost of it and this is what like this significantly helps with uh, making Houdin more performance to deal with a uh, high ratio of like updates and updates. At the same time, if you think about it, the reason we had the data latency of 30 minutes in the past is because we don't want to create a new version of the files every five minutes. Uh, we, so we basically batch it limited to every 30 minutes. So every 30 minutes, we, we absorb all the updates within that time. With this new 2.0 uh, two, two version, we don't have that limitation anymore because we are keeping adding the data in a profile and we have an asynchronous compact here. So we can have this ingestion service running every five minutes. We can have it running much faster. And we can absorb the, the cost of write in our compact at the later time. So this is the main reason that we are right now that we have rolled out 2.0 in production. We are able to go and reduce the frequency of ingestion from 30 minutes every 30 minutes to down to five to 10 minutes. Cool. Uh, I think I'm out of time. Okay, so uh, I, I, I covered most of the stuff. If you want to learn more about the details, uh, we have a, a multiple engineering blog posts that covers different aspects. The one that I highly recommend you guys to read is like uh, the one called Uber's Detector Platform. It's a more detailed version of the talk I just gave. It has a lot of examples and details if you want to read it. Uh, so that's one. And then if you want to look into how our ingestion platform works, we have one detailed blog post on, on memory. <laughs> so you guys can refer to that. Uh, at the same time, we have another blog post on Udi. So definitely refer to these two, these three. Uh, at the same time, we are, if you, if any of the topics that I talked about is interesting to you, uh, we are actively hiring for our office in San Francisco or in Palo Alto. So either send me an email or send an email to this email address or come and talk to me afterwards and we can see whether there is a good match or not. Uh, having said that, I think I'll wrap it up here. Uh, hopefully you have time to take a few questions uh, and then I'll hand it over to you. Can Oh, I see. Oh, sure. Yeah, definitely. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, definitely. All good. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. A very good question. So the question is how Uber manages schema evolution over time. And it is a natural part of like a data platform going. Uh, so I, I mentioned that we started enforcing schema in the early days. And to be able to do that, we start, we build a service called schema service that uh, uses Avro to enforce back forth compatibility of the data as the schema evolves. The problem is like, it works perfectly fine in theory, but the problem is like, uh, it, it's not like, Avro, we can't have full Avro backward compatibility in practice. Avro is very generous with what it calls backward compatibility. So when you have Avro with the sets of backward compatibility rules, then you have Parquet, which has a subset of those, and then you have high meta store, which even has like a like subset of those. So what we did, we started enforcing those as restriction on top of our uh, Avro backward compatibility. So our schema service, first make sure any schema change is backward compatible based on Avro, on top of that, it looks at the different uh, the, the, the different restriction that we have based on parquet and five other stores to make sure it's like free traffic. What we steal from again, it's pretty stable right now. But again, once in a while, you hit a corner case, and you have to add that as a new restriction. Could you say a little more about your data quality issues? 
allow you to take problems faster and you can mediate it faster? Very good question. So the question is how about our data quality and how we detect data quality issues in practice. So we build, we spend a lot of time building a data pipelines monitoring service. It's called Nightwatch, and hopefully we can open source it sometime next year. And what it does is basically it batches the data based on the timestamp and it tracks the data across the pipelines and it ensures the completeness, freshness, and latency of the data. Freshness is basically maximum timestamp you see at the end. Completeness is when for a specific time interval you have received all the data at the end. And latency is mostly, so completeness is a relative term. You can say, okay, what's the completeness of the data in Hadoop for time, let's say eight to nine this morning. And I'll give you a number, it's maybe 80%. And over time, so it starts going up. So, but not all the application requires 100% data completeness. So we have it in flexible way. You can query the completeness and you can run your query based on whether that is good for you or not. Latency is defined at a certain completeness level. We provide in Hadoop data like right now four nines of completeness. So you can ask a certain tables and point and ask it to give you the latest time interval for which we have four nines of completeness. And, but we track every record that gets to our pipelines. So we have schema enforced. Because of that, a lot of data may have like corner cases that have bad schema. So we put them in a side table called error tables, but we report them as a separate metrics. So we know exactly what goes where uh, and we can report it back to the users. Yeah. Uh, a few slides back when you spoke of your DDS, you mentioned that one of the things that you added was an index of data file and data. Okay. How is that index different from the data catalog? So, so this is indexing per table at the record levels. So think about, for example, your retrieves table. You have uh, billions of records, right? That's the, the, the index right. that it provides. Good. So, and the, I, the reason for that is you have you all these records, right? You partition them, but in one particular, you still have a few millions of records, right? 100 millions, right? You get an update on one record, and you have to find the file that has that record. Otherwise, you can't update that record, right? Mm -hmm. And that is the index that I mean. It's used at the storage level by Hoodie, it's implemented within the Hoodie to find the exact file that is listed on our picture. And there's different ways. Even Hoodie has multiple, okay. oh, oh. Uh, even Hoodie has multiple implementations for that. It has a basically a, I think a default uh, room index user, uh, uh, index. We, we just implemented, and I think we are gonna uh, write a blog post on that, a global indexing. That lets you so, so kind of really, and right now it has a relatively good indexing to find the records, specific mm -hmm. records within one partition. But it still it relies on users the input to find the partition that it goes to. The problem is if someone hits the wrong timestamp, you're gonna go and start yeah. looking at exactly. So the global indexing solves that problem by having exactly what partition, what records, and what file contains that record. Which file not uh, which file not in the files? Correct. We, we are still going back and forth in terms of whether the data records in the file should be sorted or not. Uh, there's pros and cons for doing that. Uh, but, but yes, correct. We're not exactly. But, yeah. Uh, so, yeah. 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 Okay, so, so the question is, if you have an existing data set, how we convert that to, to, to Kudi? And you were specifically asking that Kudo has support for that. Okay. Okay. So right now, uh, we don't have a support for that. So if you want to do that, we have tools in Kudi library that allows you to convert the data into Kudi file formats. Uh, and we did that for a lot of our historical data set that we wanted to support. For example, when we had GDPR, so we built Hoodie in 2016-17 based on the nature of our data set. Later in 2018, the GDPR requirements came out that requires uh, like all the companies to go and actually update and delete historical data in Hadoop. And we started using Hoodie uh, to, do, to enforce that technology. But because of that, there was a lot of historical data that was traditionally I, 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 uh, assumed as append only like Kafka data sets, but we had to convert them into Hoodie data sets. So we build a bunch of tools that convert the data into Hoodie file formats, but it takes some time and it takes some compute resources. We are considering in 2019, a 
the way that you can, you don't need to rewrite the whole parquet files. You can scan them and create an index next to the files without regenerating the whole data. So it makes it much better, much more efficient and much more scalable. Uh, it's not good. For example, hopefully coming soon. But feel free, if you if you're interested, we can collaborate on that. Oh, that's exactly the problem. Okay, fair comment, fair comment. Uh, it's, uh, it's ongoing uh, and it's coming soon, hopefully. Any other questions? Yeah, sure. Uh, you mentioned that in uh, Uber DQ, you have uh, some layers between the header files and the header files that have to run three. What kind of dynamic do you do? Oh, okay. So, uh, uh, I'll repeat the question and I'll answer it. So the question is, in Hudi 2.0, we have a base parquet file and an Apple file next to it, and the merge is happening on the query side, right? Okay? Uh, actually, not true. So, so you have a base parquet file and you have an Apple file next to it. So there are different, so we have to provide two view on the same data set. One, we call it basically a read optimized view, which means the query doesn't uh, get the performance speed because of merging these two, which means you would only see the base parquet file but we also have an asynchronous compactor that compacts this to a certain time interval. So the policy for that we do that compaction is based on when we have enough data to justify the rewriting or every few hours. So we'll always have a latency that is based on Correct. On the read optimized view of the tables, you have that latency. The good news is, most of the users who are basically who care about recent data, so the recent dates partition, that's where all the new records goes, right? So those, you're gonna have enough data that you could just compact it quickly kicks in and the data gets compacted and gets it for the user very fast. The, the, this case happens mostly when you have one record from two years ago that gets updated. And you don't wanna go immediately divide the big file because of one record updated, right? So you wait for two hours and then do the compaction. And those are mostly in the past, so it doesn't usually uh, affect the query that much. But, but at the same time, we do have a, a basically a real-time view of the same table that does this merging on the fly. And those are the use cases that are willing to pay the extra compute cost to get access to five years data. Is that it is abstracted for the users. So same tables. Again, you have everything laid out on this in separately. So it's whether the, on the query side, the user set the flags that basically merge these two or not. By the way, that merging part, it's right now, it's not rolled out in production. We, are, we have the Hoodie 2 pointer rolled out. That merging part is what we're currently working on to provide to, to, to draw it out in production in the best possible way. Okay. Any other questions? Well, thanks a lot uh, for taking the time and attending this talk. I'll be hanging around after, like Stefan Stark, if you want to talk to me afterwards. But again, my email is there. If you need me, send me an email or like, send, ping me, send me a message on LinkedIn. Thanks. Hello everyone. Um, thank you, Reza, for introduction. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Chester, for organizing this event. Thank you, uh, Workday, for hosting us tonight. And thank everyone for coming this rainy day. Um, yeah. So my name is Stefan. I've been at Uber for four years and uh, almost four years. And last two years, I've been working on uh, Michelangelo platform team. Uh, it's our machine learning platform team. Uh, so yeah. Just before we start, like just to get sense of audience. Uh, so how many of you are like machine learning experts or trying that um, day-to-day work? Okay, wow, well, quite a lot. And how many just have some engineering background? Oh, oh great. Uh, awesome, yeah. So agenda for today's talk is we just like, we will go over all these cases, not all, like some use cases at Uber, um, uh, ML use cases Uber is using, and uh, we'll talk about uh, machine learning platform team, and we will talk about how um, some recent works that we invest into facilitate uh, speeding up experimentations experience for data scientists. Um, yeah, so not 
every problem can be solved with machine learning, right? Or it doesn't make sense to solve uh, with machine learning. For example, you won't sort array of integers with a model. Probably it can, but it's not the efficient one. So just three years ago, Uber didn't have that many use cases um, of machine learning uh, models in production at all. Um, but that has been changing last three to four years. Uh, rapid development of all these frameworks uh, in open source and research, like really boosted um, production usage of, uh, of models. Uh, yeah, one case will be a marketplace forecasting, right? Um, so we have machine learning models that can predict demand and drive a partner availability in different like locations in the city in different times of future in future. And so that's this system can like tell other system to make some actions for um, kind of like matching demand and supply, maybe it's through search price that all you will probably love and or like driver insensitive so more driver partners can uh, go to that area. Um, another use case that uh, Razor Card is over eats. It's really heavy using machine learning models everywhere. Uh, from uh, restaurant ranking uh, just for you to menu items ranking to uh, to super complicated problem of uh, estimating of <coughs> the delivery time. Um, one uh, one this one of the Michelangelo core use cases um, was uh, ETAs. Uh, uh, so my team developed advanced algorithms to calculate like what will be um, what will be uh, estimated time of arrival. But they found there is like systematic errors of that algorithm since they were able to use machine learning models to predict that error and kind of like subtract and um, uh, give the resulting value to final user. And in some cases, uh, they were able to predict uh, to improve accuracy by 50%. So it's another very recent use case with uh, advances of um, deep learning and NLP uh, is um, using machine learning in uh, customer support. Uh, so we have millions of trips every day in an Uber and some of them can, can end up with some problems like you might forget phone, you might forget uh, your wallet, I don't know, something goes wrong. So you fill out the ticket and we have a huge number of uh, support specialists like trying to resolve them as soon as, as possible. But uh, with machine learning, you can help them to speed it up. Uh, you, can, uh, you can classify your issues by types, you can let them uh, you provide templates of resolution to your customer support specialists so they can improve uh, their own like uh, efficiency. And just in general, it, it will improve uh, response time for each ticket. Yeah, and it's very super complicated models. I believe we have a blog post about that from NLP team. So check it out. Uh, um, yeah, another use case is for probably not many of you saw this, but that's driver uh, app. And uh, if you text a driver about some issue, Uber can provide you. Uh, Uber will provide you some after uh, after replies that make sense in that context of your message, uh, just to save time for driver side because it's kind of um, painful to type and drive at the same time. Probably illegal. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, and of course, uh, self driving. Um, so ATG has a lot of own infrastructure for machine learning, but they really use uh, really love uh, probably the most popular most famous component of Michelangelo, which is called Horvath. It's a framework for distributed um, uh, deployment training. And um, it allows you to scale your training, speed up your training using a lot of uh, GPUs machine in parallel. Um, this project's open sourced. Um, uh, it's part of, I believe, Linux Deployment Foundation now. And uh, hundreds of organizations are using it. It has integration with Keras, PyTorch, TensorFlow, and uh, I believe it's AW, so you can, yeah, you can use it in cloud as well. Um, yeah, so three years ago, not that many use cases, um, and, but perspective was there as a uh, potential of machine learning was uh, totally clear. So the team was formed to kind of like explore uh, what building blocks can we provide to everyone at Uber so they can like speed up uh, if they're uh, machine learning uh, usage and so yeah the, the goal was for the team to help, help engineers and data scientists uh, to just be more efficient and deliver faster and more reliable um yeah so <laughs> teams find like uh, a lot of time doing initial versions and um initial drive was to kind of like be very ui heavy like don't give uh, that many options to users kind of solve all problems for them and give this quick uh, click uh, by click uh, UI, whereas they can like set up their pipeline, data pipelines, they can 
So that pre-processing, they can choose algorithms, they can choose uh, some uh, metrics and they can just click train. And after that, they will see this uh, performance report and based on the result, they can deploy it to production uh, or retrain or whatever. Yeah, so I will go over, over right now that like some building components that Michelangelo has internally. Some of them are open source, some of them not. Um, yeah, so first one, probably is the largest any um, production level machine learning system will need to have some workflows of some set of steps. Obviously, uh, data preparation, data fetching, data pre-processing. Um, so Michelangelo provides some really nice tools for that. Um, so it's kind of like abstracts for you complexity of these steps. Um, same for training. For training, it can be um, uh, it can be distributed uh, training for non-DL uh, like classical machine learning models. Also for deep learning models. So also Michelangelo has components for both, as well as just single node training. Um, then you have like different ways to relate model. We provide like UI, we can provide a matrix, we provide all visualizations that you need. Um, and after that, we have deployments um, also figured out for you. So you can deploy your model as a service uh, that's compatible with the rest of infrastructure, or you can use it as a scheduled backend jobs, just run predictions every day or every week. Um, and yeah, once uh, you have deployed, we also give you like a simplicity on the consumption side. Um, we provide you like clear interface, APIs and stuff like that to consume uh, from other services. Yeah, and uh, very important is uh, monitoring model predictions because um, models tend to degrade this time because they're training all data and if something changed, um, you probably want to see if model degrades. So we provide that uh, monitoring to our customers. Um, yeah, so another big piece is a feature store. And that's a very common problem for machine learning pipelines. Um, uh, it's um, it's very hard problem to find the right features because you might have a lot of them, and um, even just to prepare like this pipeline to make it feature available for online serving or for batch predictions takes time. So um, yeah, we created a centralized storage for good features, and so and also it's kind of open, open source internally, <laughs> so that people can commit their features and reuse someone else. So that was widely uh, efficient for us. Um, and also, as I said, yeah, we use Spark and Scala and Java to kind of distribute classical machine learning algorithms like decision trees, GDBoost, and uh, things like that. So anyone who will need to build machine learning training pipeline will need kind of this functionality. Um, yeah, as I mentioned for what before, um, it really has great metrics on performance. It scales not linearly, but close to that. Um, uh, yeah, so check it out. It's uh, you can just start using it even today. Um, yeah, another piece of machine learning platform would be data model metadata management. Uh, in order to get a good model, you need to do a lot of interactions, right? You need to uh, run different, uh, maybe curate your data sets, feature sets. You need to create hyperparameters. You need maybe change some tweaks in your alg algorithms and. While doing that, you might accumulate hundreds of models, right? And it's very important to keep track of them, not don't lose your work, and also keep track of the data of associated with each training. So we also take care of that. Um, um, yeah, that's what I said. Yeah, and also one big of areas that we invest a lot is uh, visualizations work. Uh, so it's if you have raw data, it's really hard to analyze what's happening. So we, we invested a lot in different tools to help to figure out what features are useful, what features are not really uh, important, like just to help to understand how model works and operates inside. That's, I guess, an example of some trees. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so visualization is something that will be needed for everyone. Um, yeah, and deployment, of course. Uh, so every model uh, in Michelangelo can be converted to jar file. Um, so we can, then we can dynamically upload this file to this hosting uh, host and uh, dynamically load so it can be available for serving uh, with just a few clicks from UI. Um, yeah, and we provide a prediction service that is doing great that. We define a clear interface. So each model has, um, has a clear interface hub to uh, communicate with that through a production services. And we, uh, we built a monitoring, alerting, uh, logging, and all the all stuff that needed for any production-ready service. Um, 
Uh, what else here? Yeah, that should be enough. Um, yeah, I covered this before beyond just classic uh, basic um, service monitoring like um, SLAs, uh, like uh, latency and what QPS right now. Uh, you want to see for mod model specific data uh, metrics like uh, does model degrade or not. Um, and this is how Michelangelo is structured. Basically, uh, we're not machine, we don't build models for people. We try to help other teams to build either uh, solutions just for them or build platforms that solves like big chunks of problems like ETAs, right? It's, uh, it can be, it's used for, for both EATS and for rider business. Um, yeah, and marketplace can be used for freight as well, for EATS and for rider. Um, and we we're trying to close the work with different research groups like Uber AI team, uh, so they can guide us like what the new stuff we need to add. So it's very, uh, just to make sure we're uh, doing the right thing. Okay, so yeah, Michelangelo was built like in the last three years and it's become very popular among uh, engineers and data scientists, but there is always but, uh, it restricts you, right? Um, if something is not available in Michelangelo, it will, uh, like new algorithms, new framework, new version of the fr framework. So it takes some time for engineers to add that. Some things like uh, NLP pre-processing stuff might be even like super hard to add because we need Java, remember, Java or Scala. So it might be super hard to quickly add that. So, but with recent development in um, AI and NLP and deep learning, it's become data centers that comes to Uber and works on Uber. They just use notebook, just take some data and with scares with all of that, they have really good model, train it really quick, and uh, there is no way for them, easy way to like get their work to try in production, because it's super important to try first before invest time into, into implementation, right? Um, it might take weeks or months to add something. You, you wanna know that, does this will this model work in future or not? Does it worth to invest? So that was um, kind of a uh, problem. Uh, also, model development was, Velocity becomes super important for uh, for uh, data scientists, right? Uh, with Java and Scala, speed is not as fast as it would love. And we've figured out that the, the by far the most popular language they, they use is Python. Um, so yeah, so kind of not easy to bring Python to Java. <laughs> um, so that's become a problem. And that's, uh, uh, we started sewing uh, in last year and we come up with a project called Pymo. Um, that helps to cross this cast for users. And so the idea is, uh, ambition was like, okay, you have your model training locally, results are promising. What can we do to quickly enable you to, um, to try it in production? Maybe send some shadow traffic, traffic to your model or send maybe just 5%. Um, maybe it's not as efficient as it could be with Java or Scala, but even with Python, you still can get uh, decent results. Uh, yeah, so we started working on this project um, uh, and we were able to finish it and I will go over the next uh, couple of minutes or how it works and what we achieved. Um, yeah, so that's what I basically said. It's a bridge between two, two uh, islands. Uh, hopefully it won't collapse. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so yeah, so on one side, PyML it's, uh, allows you to um, bring any model from anywhere. It's, it can be, it can rely on any dependencies that you love, um, um, but at cost of efficiency, right? Um, like on the other side, it can take care of end-to-end -end workflows for you in a few clicks, but it has a limited uh, uh, set of algorithms that you can use, um, and set of uh, data transformations that you can use. Um, and yeah, and one good thing, if you through this by email that your model is worth investing, you can always, allocate engineering time and efforts to bring it to Java world and to use all efficiency of classical Michelangelo. Okay, that's, so PyML consists of three big parts. First of all, we worked on model packaging stuff, right? How we can define interfaces and um, interfaces and uh, just practices on how you package your stuff, right? Locally and in such a way that it can be used later in production systems. and. Um, once you've done, once you've done that, uh, we opens two ways to consume your model. One is uh, for online batch prediction, so you can run, um, you can run, you can evaluate your model on large data sets on our compute 
faster instead of your local uh, computer, and also for online serving, so you can deploy your model as um, as a service with Michelangelo. Yeah, so usage. Um, we really wanted to make this tool as simple as possible, uh, so data scientists don't uh, need to uh, kind of like do heavy training on this. So it was the goal was like make a small as uh, simple as possible. So hopefully we choose it. Uh, so yeah, so to install, you just once you have a training model, you can just install it. You can install PyML. It won't work. Don't try. <laughs> it's internal package. Um, <laughs> uh, I didn't change slides. Um, anyway, step two, you will need to. We will ask you to provide like very simple uh, model Py glue code, uh, which tells us how to load uh, your serialized model and uh, shows us how to run actual predictions. In step three, you will need to define your environment. And that was the biggest selling point of PyML was like, okay, you can pick any packages you want. You can pick even Debian, so in packages of TXT, you can provide even Debian packages if you need some specific uh, libraries. And if it's not even that not enough, you can set up uh, in stub.sh, you can add any custom steps, maybe you want to download source code, you want to compile that. So all of that is possible. And we will use uh, that to prepare a kind of isolated environment for you. And yeah, and uh, after that you can deploy uh, and upload, uh, upload uh, batch credit and uh, deploy as an online service. Uh, yeah, so glue code looks like that. Uh, you just you need to predict. Um, uh, PyML provides two um, basic models. One is called data frame, and another one is called um, uh, tensor model. Uh, so data frame expects you to. So you see, predict has I don't know, and <laughs> it can be anything, but we enforce. Uh, Pandas data frames as input and pandas data frames as output. And same for tensor model, we enforce numpy array as input and numpy array as output. Um, why we did that? Uh, we talk with data scientists that don't really want to write um, proto files or street files or even JSON, uh, like definitions. Stuff. And we decided, okay, we will take care of that for you. And so we we do all of that. We still need serialization in order to do like uh, cross uh, RPC calls. So we kind of hidden that from uh, data scientists. Um, yeah, that's how environment setup looks like. Um, you can use Spice, you can provide pandas, uh, different versions if you, if you like. Um, and yes, yeah, that's how you init and upload your model. So basically, you import the PyML model, you point it to the folder with uh, environmental setup and your glue code and your model, and serialized model, and we will. Uh, package all of that and upload to our backend and uh, prepare a um, Docker image. So yeah, so we, um, yeah, so how we package that? Um, we uh, we using Docker. So basically, from the, all your environment setup, we prepare a Docker file and then we execute the Docker file and we build a Docker image that can be used uh, across uh, across with them. That's how. It's basically, the problem is the best uh, way for us to isolate completely isolate environments. Because we might run out one of our prediction posts, might run many models with totally different environments. So, um, yeah, and batch predicts. So, as you saw from before, with having, we have a lot of clean data and we invest a lot of uh, data quality, and just data platform is really good. And so, people can just write a query with all their features and uh, provide model IDs that they received from, from before. and with destination table, and we will spin up a PySpark job, distributed PySpark job on our compute cluster. So uh, you can just evaluate and run evaluation on, uh, on the model. Uh, it can help uh, like to, uh, it's like, can speed up process 10x comparing to what you can do uh, on your local. And sometimes it's just impossible to feed everything in local, like trips data or like billions of trips. Or it's hard. Um, yeah, and uh, that was a goal of the projects, kind of make it super easy to deploy your model. And that's uh, API, yeah, it's hopefully simple enough. Um, yes, yeah, so uh, with deployment, it's uh, all out of the box features of Michelangelo comes into as well with PyML. You have um, UI to manage, you have uh, all integrations with uh, metric systems, with uh, monitoring systems, and all nice perks that Michelangelo provides. Um, yeah, I just need to check time. Okay. Yeah, architecture. So it's a bit more engineering heavy, uh, if you're curious. Um, yeah, so from before we had JAR models and ba JAR based models, and we moved to uh, Docker based models. So we need to update a lot of existing infrastructure to work. It's a big change. 
so yeah, so we did that. Um, it gave again a huge benefit because uh, previously even to change version of TensorFlow was a big pain. Um, and now it's, you, can, you don't need us engineers and you don't see, don't even see engineers to do that. Um, and yeah, and we reuse exact same Docker for both offline and online. So it's really important for machine learning uh, production systems because uh, it's kind of guarantees consistency between predictions. It's not always the case. It's not always easy to achieve. Um, yeah, so offline predictions, we generate a PySpark job for you uh, behind the knees. We allocate enough resources on our compute cluster to run as a job. And uh, yeah, it's just simple. Uh, for online predictions, architecture is a bit different. So we used to have only kind of left part online prediction service, uh, which was loading jar models. Um, and now, uh, instead of loading jar models in memory, we we asking it uh, to uh, launch a nested Docker container with uh, uh, your model. And we PyML uh, infrastructure provides a gRPC service inside of the Docker and spin up server, uh, and um, they communicate with they hosted on the same machine and uh, they communicate between each other using the main Unix domain sockets. So it's, there is some um, finality for that, but uh, it's basically it depends on the amount of uh, data to be transferred and it's, which is not huge for model online model predictions. Um, yeah, uh, so we, yeah, we were basically the biggest achievement of PyML was saving a lot of time for data scientists. So instead of waiting for engineers uh, for weeks or months to finish their job, they can do everything in, like, in terms of hours and have everything ready for their teams to be for consumption in terms of hours. Um, but with kind of the superpower comes a lot of uh, other types of problems. One of them is reproducibility. Uh, for example, uh, uh, genius data scientists come up with a great model uh, and was able to professionalize it. and. Uh, uh, then he left, I don't know, maybe change team or, uh, or a company and it's become a black magic box now. Uh, so we want to kind of invest more time into, into solving this problem. Make sure we know exactly what's, what's happening, how the model is prepared so we can uh, retrain it in future. Um, it's in general a big problem in the machine learning community and uh, yeah, we have some techniques to do that, but uh, especially for transfer learning, right? You keep transferring models and uh, uh, you might just lose this lineage and uh, yeah. Um, and another part is, okay, actually I have this model, it works really nice, but it's Python, right? At the end of the day, it's still Python and it's more expensive than Java. And uh, in large cases, it might be an issue, right? Um, you have like triple level uh, QPS, it might be an issue. Um, <clears throat> So uh, it's not always easy way to transfer that to, uh, to Java world, right? If you use spices, how to get that in Java? So that's the question that we're also going to know as next. Um, so that's just pieces moving from for PyML. Uh, Mike Lange as a whole has uh, also big stories. Um, uh, probably uh, you can, yeah, we cover them in our blog post about scaling Michelangelo. Uh, so yeah, I, I won't focus it on that here. Yeah, that's a team. Luke is also sitting here, so feel free to ask if to catch us and talk. Um, yeah, blog posts uh, kind of covering all these topics today. Um, yeah, that's, that's it for me. Thank you. And I guess we have some time to question. Um, so that's predictions, right? That's for just for predictions. Uh, so you're saying, what if um, on images stuff? Yeah, so that's also we didn't cover well, but we were planning to cover like um, images, like uh, what else can be there, like raw GPS logs, stuff like that. Yeah, uh, so we'll see. <laughs> I don't have an answer for that. On the, the feature side of things, they're, they're very important to have high quality. How do you help the designers who create the feature ETL to make sure that it's healthy and manageable and monitored? Uh, that's what uh, Rise was covering, right? We have uh, a lot of data trust. Uh, so it's purely the other system that creates the, the ETL for the features. Yes, they, uh, we help them create pipelines and uh, 
to feed populate features, yeah. And uh, they can use existing services to ensure quality of data. That's for offline training and online? Yeah, that's the beauty of a feature store. It's kind of uh, highs for you um, complexity and transformation, but uh, for when you're using for online service, we're actually using Cassandra to quickly fetch data. And for offline, we generate like um, join Hive queries to do that. So it's more efficient, yeah. So it's kind of hides all that complexity for you. What is the monitoring happening? Is it email, Snapchat, or? Uh, data monitor? Uh, I believe they have, yeah, they can, they use M3 and emails and uh, yeah, you have standard ways. Oh, okay, yeah, please. Okay, so the question is uh, how we handle intermodal dependencies. Um, so the answer is uh, each model is a service, right? So basically, if uh, you have a caller that can like, invoke them in any way else. But I don't know about um, use cases when one model calls another model directly. We might have a um, service consumer service that can orchestrate the work, but uh, I don't think they directly communicate between them. Uh, I'm curious, how do you manage or organize uh, your knowledge that is well by other scientists? And how do you avoid uh, screen language? Yeah. Good question. <laughs> um, yeah, so the question of how we uh, accumulate knowledge about uh, uh, model creation by data and scientists to make sure uh, people don't reinvent wheel all the time. Um, Hard to say. <laughs> so we have internally, we have uh, this process called RFC process over. So when you're doing something, you need to come up with document and explain what you're trying to do. And you need to share with, some, with a large group of people. So uh, ideally that's what's happening. Um, just by sharing, by, by sharing to uh, com common place. Yeah, the, we don't have any strict rules for that or it's so I personally didn't, so maybe, yeah, maybe I will. Oh, sure. When a data scientist creates a pipeline, for example, what really happens behind the scenes? What is the architecture, say, trace, the mapping of that, and how long do these things take? And when they don't need that pipeline anymore, what happens? Yeah, um, so the question is how, what's happening behind the scenes when, when data scientists create by, uh, machine learning pipelines? Oops. Um, uh, so there are a lot of things happening, so it's kind of hard to cover. Um, so but Uber is using, uh, uh, there is a tool in Uber called Piper. It's kind of similar to Airflow from Airbnb. And we try to generate pipeline automatically in that, using that tool. And we have components uh, that are doing like all this data preparation, training, stuff like that. So we generate that pipeline, we launch it. Uh, and uh, if people don't use it, uh, there is no consumption. We can after kind of after clean up. Okay. So you think it's very easy for Yeah, this is a great question. Uh, yeah, so we have some, we're not there yet. So first of all, we make sure that um, uh, the stuff that you have locally, it's kind of can be replicated in production system because you might have different libraries and they computational libraries, like mass, mass libraries, and they can do different stuff uh, from your, let's say, max. Um, so yeah, we have, we ask users to provide input, sample input and output, um, and we make sure that once we build image, the input and output are exactly the same. Another guard, guard rails is uh, once you have your model in production, right? Um, uh, you, your model expects some certain input and output um, and that might change with time, right? And, you, and this change can break your, um, your consumer. So we make sure we, that we store schemas, we store uh, input and output schemas and we uh, enforce compatibility between. Um, so that's another guard rail. Yeah, that's what comes up. Uh, can you elaborate? For example, uh, you have an offline data set. Did you also assume that 
to represent your new state of operation. And you train your machine learning model. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, that's great. That's what, what we were calling uh, monitor prediction monitoring. Um, so the question is, how can we? How can we? I'm not sure how we can understand. So for example, you're recommending that restaurant really like this. Yeah. How do you make sure that it's working for people and people are able to decide? Right. Right. Got it. So question is how we can make sure that models uh, are working properly uh, with recent output inputs and outputs. Um, so in order to do that, you need to have ground truth at some point, right? And uh, it's not in all cases that's possible. For example, um, it's easy to do with ETAs, right? When you suggested one ETAs and in like once the trip is done, you can uh, get actual ETAs, you can compare results and you see, oh, model is doing well or model is not doing well. For things like rankings, a bit harder. Um, yeah, so it depends on this case, and it's we need to work with customer closer to define this ground truth. If it's available really fast from um, really quick from after predictions, we can optimize it. Plus, we can join with, uh, predictions with actual results and build these charts. Oh. That, yes, so before rolling out a large scale, uh, we have uh, internal platform called XP experimentation. And you can always enable uh, your service, your model to some small percentage of user and compare results like with others. Yeah, so. Last question. Yeah. Uh, there's a follow up on that. So there's a recent Google paper called Item Suggest, and one of the core contracts for Ethereum is they have similar models. Uh, ranking prediction framework mm -hmm. is that you must give feedback to right. the model. Right. Yeah, yeah. That's not it. Right. Right. Let's give a big box to uh, both speakers. I, I want to say a few words. Uh, first of all, I want to also thank Nika, who's sitting there, who helped you, uh, you know, want to help set up the uh, uh, online streaming for the people online. So uh, she's a uh, partner from the guy camp. Uh, a few words about our coming event. In February, we have two events scheduled. One is uh, about the streaming uh, things, and it's going to be hosted at uh, this. And the people, uh, the, we're working with a uh, speaker from Google and other this talking about this. This is going to be hosted at uh, this. And the second one is. Uh, we have two talks, one from the, uh, Facebook. We're going to talk about the uh, effective deep learning on mobile devices. So, and, and also the other talk from Jorge, uh, the person that uh, Henry Zong is, uh, and his team is going to talk about how they do machine learning in the workday use cases. In March, we have, uh, we're currently working on the, the topics. One talk is already settled, is from Google. They're going to talk about the auto ML. And then the other talk is exactly suggested by the uh, workflow. I mean, sorry, work day, uh, they, uh, they recommended that Airbnb is going to talk their platform in the machine learning. So stay tuned. So all these are uh, uh, going to be announced, announced them once we settle the date of this event. So uh, finally, Shim was a bot on my team. I, I, I work for GoPro. Uh, I'm the manager for data science and engineering team. So we have one position open. If anyone <laughs> <laughs> and you can come to, to, to talk to me. Thank you so much.